Good morning, everybody. Uh, we have a unique opportunity here, and that is to explore the Arctic in a different sort of way. From all the talent that we have at this conference, and there is a lot of it, not a lot of it is dealing with what's happening underwater in the Arctic. And we have to keep in mind that, let's say, a place like Antarctica is a continent. It is a landmass that is surrounded by a pretty tumultuous ocean, but the Arctic itself is an ocean. It is an ocean that is surrounded by land. So what I will do now is sort of talk about my experiences diving up there for about the last four or five years. Uh, my name is Paul North. That's right, North, like the direction. Uh, that is what I have to tell the phone operators as they're misspelling my name on this and that. And that is a good coincidence, because that's where we are talking about during this conference. Uh, I'm many things, like all of us are, but how I identify is as a marine educator. I think the oceans are quite vital to our planet in ways that uh, have, we've sort of let slide from the forefront of our minds. And I also think that the health and continuing uh, climate conversation is directly connected to the ocean as well. And that is why I started Meet the Ocean. Now, as a title, you might say, well, I know the ocean. I know that it is lovely, I like to swim in it, I, I like to eat the fish that come from it, but my goal is to introduce you to the ocean that you do not know. And uh, I'm assuming that that includes the Arctic. Uh, what you're seeing here is what I want to do. I want to grab hold of your attention. And I'll do basically anything to do that. It might be comedy, it might be drama, there's all of those things going on in the ocean. Uh, like this cheeky octopus who was literally trying to steal my camera in Australia about a month ago. Uh, for Lindblad Expeditions, I work as an undersea specialist. That means as we are bringing people to these magnificent places, my job is to go diving. You can see here uh, the camera setup that I'm using, and I'll talk to that in a moment, but my journey with Lindblad started in Alaska, but I never knew that it was going to take me to such places as the Norwegian coast, or the fjords of Svalbard, Iceland, both coasts of Greenland, and one of my favorites, the Canadian Arctic, which is just brimming with life in a way that we don't get to see in our day-to-day -day experience because we are terrestrial. And when we do get in the water, we can only do so for a short amount of time. Usually what I'm doing down there is about a 45-minute dive, and what am I looking for? basically the best of what I can find. And why do I choose to work for and with Lindblad Expeditions? Well, it's because we take you there. We, we take you to these places that you only see in the pages of National Geographic. We take you to places that I think have a category of bucket list or, or dream trip. And we do this over and over again with the kind of regularity and the kind of experience that allows us to accent your experience what we bring on board, the talent, the many years in these places, adds to what you get when you sign up with us on these trips. Now, the Arctic provides. It provides a, a landmark, uh, like you see here, a beautiful Zodiac ride that you may just never forget. We have pretty much perfect pieces of ice that, from a photography standpoint, you could spend nearly all day with circling around it in our vessels, trying to find a way to sort of unlock your own photographic portal. Uh, this one here was larger than the room that we are in right now. The highest up that I have ever been in the Arctic is north of 82 degrees latitude. That's less than 500 miles from the North Pole. And what did we find? A whole lot of nothing. But it was a beautiful nothing. As you can see here, uh, we got some brash ice, and even some bird life that's around, but of course we were looking for bears and we had to go north of 82 degrees latitude in order to find them. Perhaps some baleen behemoth is what you're looking for when you're up in the Arctic, or it could even be uh, a different kind of blubbery beast, because these are all there. And these are all related and connected to the marine environment, uh, but it is what is down below that interests me the most. I go on these trips, these expeditions, to interact with the water. So let's talk about what that means when you're diving in the polar regions. Uh, I really like this photo of my dive buddy because she's trying to smile. <laughs> it's a dive that was uh, on the north coast of Norway, 
and we'd been underwater for about 50 minutes, which means what happens? Well, first the lips go numb after about 10 minutes. Then you start losing feeling in your extremities, fingers and toes, which we need all of those for our photographic equipment, don't we? Uh, and also that stuff that keeps you alive. You want to be able to manipulate the equipment that you have on you. When you're diving in salt water, we have to keep in mind that the salinity content actually lowers the freezing point. So what might freeze at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and fresh freezes at a much lower temperature, about 28.2 uh, when you're talking about salt water. The coldest water that I've ever been in was in Antarctica and it was 27.2. These are vacation temperatures. These are balmy. They make me ask myself why I didn't become a marine biologist studying dolphins in Florida. Much easier stuff. But our undersea program is quite unique because as you are there to experience all that you will on our vessels, we get to bring you that extra bit of what's happening underneath the ship. And we do so in these waters using dry suits. Now, a dry suit is entirely different than a wetsuit. A wetsuit is designed to let water in. A dry suit is designed the opposite, to keep it out, hopefully. That doesn't always happen. But as you can see here, I have an exhaust valve on one of my shoulders. That is to let air out. There's one on my chest that lets air in. But from a photography standpoint, I'd like you to take a look at the dry gloves that I wear. Now underneath those dry gloves are several other wool gloves, so you're really starting to lose a lot of dexterity at this point. And those small teeny tiny buttons that are on the back of any camera, uh, but also in underwater housing, become more difficult to manage when you have uh, such an obstruction there that's making you lose your dexterity. And also keep in mind that the temperature is making you lose feeling in your fingers. Can you tell I'm trying to extract empathy from you? <laughs> All right, good. So what are we doing with our gear? Well, it's actually kind of unique because there's so many divers that cycle through. We usually stay on board for about a month and then we pass the gear on to the next diver, hoping that they've taken good care of it. I don't think many in the room would be okay handing your camera off to someone to use for a month. Uh, but that's kind of the setup that we have and you're seeing it on screen here. This is a naughty cam housing, that's the underwater housing. And you can see you have some articulating arms, very flexible. On the end of those are some very strong LED lights. And what is inside that housing is a Sony RX100. This is a very reliable handheld camera that takes amazing video and pretty spectacular macro photography. And that's what we're using down below. And don't worry, clarity is never an issue, <laughs> ever. Those wide angle shots, they always work. Well, you have to think about it, right? A place like the Arctic is seasonally covered with ice. And what's happening on land is often that there are glaciers around. And if you don't know, every glacier has its own meltwater river. So it's actually spitting out water that is full of sediment. That sedimentation mixing with the fresh water and salt on the top layer creates a brackish layer. Fresh water sits on top of the salt. And inside that brackish layer, the sediment holds. So sometimes for the first 10, maybe 30 feet, you're gonna deal with very low clarity, often a lot of tannins and glacier silt in the water. But this is just the realities and the challenges of diving in the Arctic, which is one of my favorite things to do. Now when you approach someplace new, when you speak with the captain and as he's deciding where to set down, where to put the anchor, you're looking at the chart. You're asking yourself, well, where in this icy landscape can I actually put myself in the water safely, hopefully? Uh, you can see that we have to push through a lot of brash ice from time to time, and conditions do change. You never really know what you're gonna be dealing with until you get there. And when you do, then you have to put all that gear on. It takes me about a half an hour just to get the dry suit on, and that's before I put all this other gear on. And uh, a, a quick nod to my hero there, Ernesto, on our dive boat, because as you can see, he is an assistant uh, in a maximum capacity kind of way because there is so much gear that we have to put on that, well, we need help. But 
it is worth it. Because what do you find? You find squiggly wiggly things like this larvisian. Don't worry, it's not dangerous. And also, you're related to it. So check the family history there. But what we're dealing with here are the creatures in the water column. We're, we're talking about plankton, the small life that isn't able to swim against the ocean's current. All plankton are defined not by what they are, but by what they cannot do. So if you cannot swim against the ocean's current like this small snail here, which is known as a sea butterfly, it's also scientifically called a pteropod. Now we know snails to crawl across the bottom, but this one has split its foot and essentially used it to fly through the water. It's about the size of a US dime, which means that I am recording it with a macro lens, which means that I have to follow it through the water column, and I'm often in this position when I'm doing so. What eats a sea butterfly? Well, it would be a sea angel. You're looking at it here, two organisms that have co-evolved, have chased each other through the water for millions of years. You can tell this one is much more streamlined, a more able predator to be able to chase after those little bits. You may have heard of krill. Here's a cousin of krill. This is a mycid shrimp. Let's call it seahorse food. But it also exists in the Arctic in a huge, abundant way. This is one of the main food sources in the Arctic, are those small crustaceans. But when you swim in strange places, you encounter strange things, like this jellyfish here. Colloquially, I like to call it the karate chop jellyfish, as you can see it moving itself through the water. But this is nothing more than a stomach, an ability to catch food, and an ability to move from A to B. But it is a strategy that has worked for over 500 million years, pre-Cambrian even. What you're looking at here is a comb jelly, older than all the jellyfish, no stinging cells upon it, just a sticky substance to capture its food. But with all this nutrients, with all this life, with all this diversity, of course you're gonna have those apex predators, like this lion's mane jellyfish here. Now, when you're talking photography, you often have to ask, how close do you really want to get to your subject? In this case, not that close. This is one of the largest jellyfish on our planet. In uh, years past, it has been measured at nine feet at the bell. Nine feet, not something you truly want to get entangled with. But what you're seeing here is prey that it has captured. It's grabbed hold of a comb jelly, which is much larger than it, but it's largely gelatinous and filled with water. So over time, it will make a meal out of this, and a very good one, actually. But jellyfish are part of a phylum called nadarians. And there are about 11,000 of those throughout our oceans. And nadarians use a strategy to actually, upon contact, shoot a stinging cell and poison into their prey. Now, this strategy works in the water column with the swimmers, with the jellyfish, et cetera. But it's also on the bottom with the anemones with the stalked jellies like you saw previous to this one. This is a sessile strategy, meaning that they stick to the bottom. They stay there. They wait with open arms for something to come in contact with them. But a jellyfish does not. A jellyfish moves. It seeks its prey. And as you can see here, this fish has been captured. You're looking inside the stomach of a jellyfish right now. It's called the manubrium. And you can see this fish did not have a lucky day and it is soon to be digested, but what a compelling way to get up close and just understand how the biology of these creatures actually work. I never know what I'm gonna find, but when I find it, it amazes me. Because life prevails in the Arctic, but it does so more so below than it does above. And Here's an interesting relationship between predator and prey, because what these fish are doing are actually using the jellyfish as a home, as a floating defense, because other creatures know that it spells danger, so they're using it to protect themselves. But in doing so, they also risk becoming food themselves. But this is why biodiversity is so necessary to our planet. These small, unconsidered relationships that we don't think about being topside as we do. But fish like this in their larval stage rely on these relationships. They rely on the other creatures that are around them, be they predator or prey, in order to live, in order to reach adulthood and procreate, which is basically what they're there to do. 
but I never knew that this happened in the Arctic until I saw it with my own eyes, until I could then bring it to others. And that's my job. I have to explain what an undersea specialist means. I could often say I'm a guy who looks at fish a lot, uh, which I'm doing right here. I don't know if you can see it because it's so well camouflaged there at the bottom of the screen. You have to get out, right? You have to get out eventually. Uh, temperature, your body basically says, I don't want to be here anymore. And also, your camera's going to die, and you're going to run out of air. So probably a good idea to get out of the water. But when I do, I can't just not talk about this stuff. It's too cool. It's too fascinating. It's too vital for us to understand that complexity and biodiversity in the natural environment is something that we need to protect. So I can't just go home and say, darling, could you please pass the mashed potatoes? I mean, I still eat, but I have to talk about it. So what I did was start a podcast to keep these conversations going. It's part of what Meet the Ocean does, is use storytelling as a vehicle for understanding our natural world in order that we can better protect it. We have used storytelling and collected the ideas and the life history of ocean advocates, of experts across the world, and have been downloaded in 40 different countries. So the message is getting out there. And every month we're releasing something new, some new part of our planet, some new conversation about where we are now, maybe where we were 100 years ago, and where are we going. Our very first podcast was essentially the modern day Charles Darwin, one of Lynn Blad's naturalists, Ian Bullock, who is a hero of mine. Uh, you may have traveled with him if you've gone with us, but he does use a camera occasionally, but usually it's just to take a photo so that he can later draw the creature like you're seeing right here. These are six out of the 11 pinnipeds that live in the Arctic. I think the most identifiable one is the one that needs a dentist there in the middle left. But through this vision, we get to understand how that artist sees the world. We have interviewed Dr. Joe McGinnis, who dove underneath the North Pole. He actually called the Canadian Prime Minister from underneath the North Pole. Unfortunately, pizza delivery was not an option, but hey, these kind of explorations are great to revisit, even though they happened decades ago. Our most recent episode was a New York Sun author and conservationist Dr. Carl Safina talking about how humans interact with the natural world. We get to speak with legends like Captain Don Walsh who went down in the Marianas Trench, one of the first humans to do so. Imagine as you're descending into the dark and you hear the creaks of the metal around you wondering if that is going to hold, if you're going to make it back to the top side to tell your tale. But we also interview those people who are on the front lines of ocean education. This scientist, Sky Murray, collaborated with me to show Antarctica above and below. So what you're looking at there is 100 different images that the colors, the pixels, have been pulled out of just to show in one graph how colorful Antarctica is below the water compared to above. 50 photographs on top, ice, glaciers, 50 photos down below, every sea creature that I could find. But I think most importantly is that we have conversations with people of all ages. Do it for the kids, right? That's what every conservationist will say. But it's also about getting their opinion. I don't interview children. I have a conversation with them. And I asked one young man, can you ever imagine an ocean that has more plastic in it than fish? Four years old. And he said, isn't that today, four years old? Were you thinking about ocean plastic when you were four years old? No, because the conversation has changed. When we visit these places, we need to understand not only their rarity, but also how we can move and make decisions in order to keep them around. One of my favorite podcasts, which you should probably listen to to figure out why it's so ridiculously titled, Polar Bears and Strawberries, uh, this was the first one that we actually had a sound designer for. So as a gentleman is talking about a polar bear breaking into his cabin, you can hear the snowy footprints outside the cabin. You can hear the terror in his voice and the wind. And we provide 
an audio experience that helps to educate. And why do I do this? Or more so, what would I do to get people's attention, to pay attention to the ocean? Well, anything. <laughs> anything. Why? Because uh, this is our planet. For all the reasons that we already know that still haven't motivated us to make the proper decisions, we need to protect it. So I'll use comedy, I'll use anything to get people's attention. And that's why Meet the Ocean is a creative platform. So you're talking about digital media, from the podcast to the videos that I shoot underwater, and specifically an art community that reaches out and says, I feel this way about the ocean. I'm going to contribute my time, my skill, my talent, so that we can build this community, so that we can have these conversations. And my understanding of the ocean did not start simply as a scuba diver. It's way more weird than that. Because I was a commercial fisherman up in Alaska for a number of years, about eight in total. So you want to talk about ocean bounty? You want to talk about ocean interaction? You want to talk about learning what the ocean actually is day to day, moment to moment? And then go live on it. Go try and make a living off of it and see what it does to you and your mind and your perception of what the ocean is. But before I was a fisherman, I was a storyteller. Now, just a few blocks away from us, we have basically the best theater in the world. And I grew up in the Hudson Valley. I used to come down to New York all the time to see these plays. And eventually, I started writing them myself. This is where I learned how to tell stories. And by telling stories and combining ocean science, we have something that is new, that is vibrant, that is entertaining, and that is starting to have an effect. I have learned two things from my diving across the world, pole to pole, and that is that color in the ocean is communication. What you're looking at here up close is a sea star in the Arctic. A sea star that was down about 70 feet, but you'd never know it because I'm so close up with my macro lens, but this is allowing you to see that nothing's growing on this sea star. Why? Because it has these little pincers that actually pick things off of it. Pincers too small for us to see, but things that allow it to survive, thrive, and even capture prey. So one, color is communication in the ocean, but also that patterns repeat. That broadcast spawning takes place, eggs and genetic material are, are thrown into the water, which is a literal buffet for anything like that jelly that was swimming along and just grabbing hold of. But what you're seeing here is a feather star. Those long arms are asking the ocean current to bring it food, which it does with great consistency. And if it is in a, is this specific creature is in a place where it's not very nutrient dense, its arms will be longer. If there's a lot of food around, then it doesn't need to grow long arms. It'll just grow short ones and catch the food as it comes on by. So let's go back underwater one more time, just to start looking at the big stuff. We already looked at what was in the water column. Here is me descending, again, questioning my life choices as my body succumbs to the temperature. But when you're diving in the Arctic, you're going to find some pretty cool stuff. Like the sea cucumber, one of my favorite creatures in the ocean, Consider it the vacuum cleaner of the ocean. And like a child indulging in a tub of peanut butter with its finger and licking it off, that is what this creature does all day, every day. They are in both polar regions and actually found throughout our planet, and they are underestimated the role that they play in purifying the water. Here's a close-up of a sea star with its feet extended. And those are used for much more than just crawling around. They're actually how they uh, breathe. They diffuse oxygen through the tissue of their feet. You've all heard of breathable shoes, right? Well, when we get up close, we can see just how magnificent a sea star is underneath and what a predator it is, too. We're dealing with a group of creatures called echinoderms, which this sea urchin is part of, too. They're called echinoderms from the Greek, meaning hedgehog skin, right? And you can see here, this is an urchin barren. Do you see a lot of kelp growing? No, it's because the urchins are there. There's also some strange things, like these skeleton shrimp, which aren't a shrimp at all. But I found the bottom of Greenland covered with millions of them hanging on to the kelp. And kelp is so important because not only does it provide food, but it provides habitat as well. As you're seeing here, this is a nudibranch hanging on a piece of kelp. 
What is a nudibranch? It is a beautiful snail that has long ago given up the shell to announce itself in floral, aesthetic, and colorful ways. And what is it saying? I'm disgusting. You probably shouldn't eat me. And that is literally their strategy. There's over 3,000 different species of nudibranch on our planet, and most people don't consider them to be a polar species, but they are. Every creature you're seeing here was filmed in the Arctic, and you're seeing that there is kelp on the bottom, there are sandy bottoms, there are rocky bottoms, all that different terrain that allows for this diversity of life to grow. And there, that small ring on the back of the nudibrink is why it earns its name. Nudibrink means naked gill. And that is actually what it breathes through. Moving up the food chain, now we have uh, more predators. This is a whelk. This is a snail that sort of moves through the ocean bottom like a bulldozer, waiting to find some prey, using chemical information, which is exactly what we do every time we inhale through our nose. We're sensing our environment. Now here's something to help you sleep at night. This is an Arctic clam worm. It can get to about three feet long, very comfortable to be next to, uh, but you can see as it articulates in real time that it is quite fast, it's quite an able predator, and all those small little feet are called parapodia, and they're used for locomotion, but they're also there to help them breathe through as well, a common strategy in the ocean. You can see that it does have eyes. Can they read the New York Times? Absolutely not, but they can tell light from dark, and that helps them navigate their environment. We have fish, flatfish like this, but then we have, I don't know, a wolf fish, pretty crazy, skin so thick you can make shoes out of it. Go to Norway and find that out. Amazing little creature to see, and actually not so little. But here's one of my most fascinating discoveries in the Arctic, because I saw this and I was like, that's a ray. I should be in the Caribbean with a cocktail in my hand and looking at bikinis, but no, I'm in the Arctic and I'm looking at a ray. It didn't compute, but they do exist there. And this one, luckily I found out later because I didn't touch it, is an electric ray. It's called a thornback. And this was well north of the Arctic Circle. I hear that they live in Antarctica too, but never at the depths that I dive. Now, I showed you a picture of a fish earlier. Now you can actually see it because I'm shining a light on it. But that is called cryptic coloration. These are creatures that are actually trying to hide in plain sight. You can see it's sort of pink coloration, matches the rocks exactly. Think about how many generations had to happen in order for their skin tone to match the rocks that they live around exactly. I will stare these fish eye to eye, and they are fully convinced that I can't see them because most creatures that they interact with don't have the ocular tissue development that we do that allows me to actually perceive it. Fascinating stuff. Beautiful, certainly speaks to the biodiversity that we're seeing, but we have to ask ourselves, how do we get this information more so out to the public? Well, recently, what I did with Meet the Ocean was do an education tour over in Australia. We use VR headsets to bring kids to the polar regions. We used interact interactive technology in order so that they could understand the immense diversity of the polar regions. And we also visited uh, schools and children's hospitals to sort of get those young minds plugged into these faraway places. Because we love to draw lines, we love to say this is Queens and that's Brooklyn, this is Russia, that's Ecuador, but in truth, it's just one planet. It's one air that we're breathing, it's one ocean that is circling throughout our planet. So that is how we get people's attention is by whatever means necessary. And on this tour, we had a kind of I wonder session, right? That, well, what is, when we're thinking about the polar regions, where do, where do our minds actually go? And if you look to the bottom right of your screen, you're gonna see a very interesting question. Do polar bears live in Antarctica? What's the answer to that? No, uh, I'm glad you know that. But let me help you explain it to other people, uh, as I did to the kids. So ursus is the Latin word for bear. So ursus maritimus, or maritimus, depending on how you pronounce it, is literally saying an ocean bear, right? Ursus, Latin for bear. But when you go back to the Greeks, who started it all, the Greek word for bear is arctos. The Greek word for bear is arctos. So arctic 
means with bear. What does Antarctic mean? Without bear. Take that home, tell the people. <laughs> I'm not going to say that this is the best photograph of a polar bear that I ever took, but it might be the most interesting. What you're looking at is a spotting scope with my iPhone held up to it. I'm a professional. But you're also seeing a kill, which is very rare. It's, it, it's a beautiful moment, natural and brutal, to come upon a bear that's chewing on some sort of recent kill. But we actually got to see the hunt. We found a swimming bear in Svalbard. And all of a sudden, it changed direction, a hard 90 degrees. So we got our binoculars, and we all swiveled in that direction. And there was a seal sleeping on the ice, a young seal pup with its mother swimming around it. Now, we think of many creatures as you know, lower than us in some way. But the cunning that this bear showed to swim and to sneak up on the seal, to choose a specific angle so even when the seal looked up, its own body blocked the view of the bear coming its way. This is all on purpose. And then what happened? The bear launched out of the water, grabbed hold of it, and pulled it in. Now, of course, we're scared of bear claws, but with polar bears, it's actually their biting power, which is the real intensity. You're talking about 1,200 pounds per square inch. So the bear held the seal until it was able to actually remove it from this world, let us say. And then it drug it back up on the sea ice, and it began to consume it. To see this process from A to Z was amazing. And it caused a lot of questions with people, like, why is the bear giving the seal CPR? <laughs> well, it was actually tenderizing the meat. It was jumping up and down on it, and it was breaking the bones uh, so that it could have an easier meal. This might seem brutal to some of you, or maybe all of us, uh, because we don't interact with nature in this wild, dangerous way every day of our lives. But for a polar bear, this is it. This is what it does. A small seal like that, let's say about 120 pounds, can provide a meal that'll nourish it for about a week, maybe a little bit more. But that's about the bare minimum. That's not going to be the kind of nutrition that it needs to survive a cold winter. So when we think about sea ice and those changing conditions, we need to understand the dietary requirements of these bears. And it is the sea ice that I would like to turn our focus to right now, because photographically, it's amazing. But when you talk about things like the marine food web and where that begins and what is necessary to make that happen, well, you're looking at it. Sea ice is essentially soil for phytoplankton. The small single-celled algae there's enough UV radiation that penetrates sea ice so that the algae grows on the underside of the ice, a blanket of green. And then what comes? The crustaceans to gnaw at it, and then the fish, and then the bigger fish, and so on and so forth, until you're actually leading up to the bears that I think we all come to these regions to see. Now, this will probably be the best photograph I ever get of a polar bear. And many people have asked me, were you in a helicopter? And I said, man, I wish. Uh, but actually, I was kneeling on the ground uh, on the highest level of the National Geographic Explorer. Everyone was at the rail. Everyone was leaning. There was absolutely no room. But I found a small gap. And I stuck my hand out. And I took a bunch of photos. And here's one of the ones I got. I call it the imperfect bear. Because as you can see, it has a, uh, a scar or a recent wound on its nose. What was that from? A fight with another male? Could be. A desperate battle for food with a walrus? That could also be. Whatever it is, it shows us just how hardy these creatures are. I mean, you're talking about a hyper carnivore, a creature that's diet is 70% meat, if not more. A creature that is an icon for how we think and we're uh, about our planet, and specifically the polar regions, enough to be confused about where they actually live. But throughout this conference, we're going to return to these bears. And each speaker is going to tell you 
their version of their interaction with them. But we all have to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Well, of course, to be there, to have the experience, to get the photos. But we are all necessitated to be ambassadors that when we do have these experiences, we can bring them back to the people who aren't fortunate enough to be there. And we can deliver things like our personal stories, but also the facts and figures that maybe you learned when you journeyed to these places, because these conversations are important. We have become a culture that has, lo it's, it's losing its sense of community. We're more individuals. We're gonna start developing a spine that looks like this as we lean down and look at our screens. But what we must defend at all costs is biodiversity. Biodiversity is the poetry of our planet. Absolutely, without a doubt. And it's definitely one of those things that we are gonna not appreciate until it's gone. And I refuse to believe that. I refuse to take part in a see it before it's gone culture. And I think many of you feel the same way. So as we're sitting here in, let us say the greatest city on earth, we must contemplate what our choices are. Photographically, of course, what lens, what camera, did I charge my battery? A very important question. But in doing so, we need to consider our effect on this planet and what we do in our everyday decisions in order to mitigate what is currently happening to our planet. So that's me. Uh, I will continue diving. I'm actually excited to say that I'll be going to the Russian Far East in August, up to Wrangell Island, up to find more bears. And let's hope that I can see them and that they're not swimming above me. Because that's one thing uh, that I'll leave you with is just imagine a situation where you're down in the water and it's very murky and all of a sudden your dive boat drops in a polar bear alarm. Yes, those exist, a polar bear alarm. What does it do? It goes, ahooga. And you say, there's a polar bear around, but where? I mean, look up at the ceiling for a second. That's about what I would be looking at as a diver, and you're not gonna be able to see the surface, but you're gonna be able to say, I'm diving in the Arctic, and this is just a part of the job. So I'm very grateful for your attention and letting me share a slice of this with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> do you guide clients in your dive? Do we, do we guide clients on our dive? Yes, but not in the polar regions. Uh, we take people diving in French Polynesia and the South Pacific, but there's just too much involved in polar diving, and there's not a strict training for polar diving. You know, I, I dove in Alaska for six, seven years before I ever went polar. Went polar, hashtag. Um, when you get to a polar region, you have so many other considerations. Like even the, the instrument that you're breathing out of has the ability to freeze. If it freezes, it doesn't stop giving you air, it explodes and gives you too much. So in those sort of emergencies, you might lose all the air in your tank in about two minutes. So to have clients in those situations is poor practice, I'd say, yeah. Do sport divers ever use hot water suits to keep warm in the cold? So a, a warm water suit is, it, well, what you're speaking of is adding hot water to your suit to sort of keep your temperature up when you're down there. No, that is not the system that we use. So we're just straight dry suit, tank, uh, easy operation. For commercial divers who are down for like four or five hours at a time, they actually put a hot water hose in and keep yeah. that water running. I used them in the 70s and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much.